Welcome to Understanding the Times. My name is Daniel Vallis, and I am the founder and editor of InformedChristians.com, a website devoted to providing discernment from a Christian perspective. One of the fallacies that I often hear pastors and teachers make is this, that Christ's return, in other words the rapture, could be 50 years or even 500 years from now. Most of them mean it innocently enough, but it is a dangerously wrong idea. The Bible gives us very clear details of the time frame and window in which Christ will return. He deliberately does not give an exact date, day nor hour, but he gives us enough signs and details that he encouraged us with, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Luke 21, 28. The danger of not recognizing the time frame, or even of paying attention, is that his return will catch many off guard. This video resource was researched and put together to help dispel myths about Christ's return and to show the clear signs that not only are we running out of time, but that all of the prophetic signs have been fulfilled. This timeline examines the past four generations, notable historic landmarks, observations about the days of Noah and Lot, as well as 40 prophetic signs of the last times and how to best understand those signs. 1 Chronicles 12.32 tells us, Of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. Here we find the listing of the mighty men who came and helped David after the death of Saul and the capture of Zion. This chapter lists the thousands of men who came from different tribes and families to assist and support David. For almost every one of the tribes or families listed, it mentions the thousands that they sent to help David. However, when it mentions the children of Issachar, it mentions that only 200 of them came, the leaders, and that they had a very distinct trait. They understood the times. Because they had a handle and understanding on the times in which they lived, which included the state of the nation, enemies, allies, families, tribes, etc., they knew what to do. They were wise men. In Esther 1.13, the Bible again uses the unique description of the king's wise men, which knew the times. Do you know the times and what you ought to do? What are the consequences of not understanding the times? Well, just from the two verses that emphasized it, we can learn many things. Number one, and most importantly, those who do not have an understanding of the times will be the least likely to know what to do. The men of Issachar were valued because their insight made them valuable counselors to David. Just like King Ahasuerus and Esther turned to the counsel of his wise men, David also relied on his counselors as well. Unless we have a proper biblical understanding of the times, then we will listen and hearken to wrong advice in a broad array of life choices. We will also miss many opportunities of service for Christ and eternity. John 4.35, Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Do we know the times and what we ought to do? Let us look now at what are the biblical signs that we should be looking for and some keys that we need to keep in mind. Key number one, Jesus Christ told his disciples that all of the end time events would occur within one generation's lifespan. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Key number two. The Bible tells us that an average lifespan is 70 years, and some average up to 80 years. The days of our years are three score years and 10, and if by reason of strength, they'd be four score years. Here, the psalmist records that the average lifespan is 70 years, and that a fewer amount of people have an average of 80 years if they are exceptionally healthy and strong. It is two averages that still largely apply even in our day with advanced medicines. The average lifespan is still 70 to 80 years. Key number three. He told them the start event which would mark the generation, the rebirth of Israel. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. This sign is the directional sign that Jesus Christ told his disciples to look for. He is basically telling them that the world will continue relatively normal 
till it gets to this point. Once this sign occurs, it will signal that the direction of everything is about to change. He then also tells them of the signs that will be distinct once that change in direction has happened. The danger that most Christians and non-Christians run into is that they are not aware or fully understand the importance of this one sign. This one sign means that history and humanity is now on a different track with a very definite end in view. If one does not grasp the significance of the start date, then there will be no sense of urgency to live for Christ, save souls, get busy for God, cleanse your life, abstain from the world, etc. Most Christians live a shallow life doing mere lip service to prophecy because they do not fully grasp that they are now on a different road and we're running out of asphalt. Jesus Christ told his disciples that the sign and mark of the start of this timeline of events would be the budding of the fig tree. When ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Just like a tree's budding signals the start of spring and summer, so a symbolic fig tree is referenced that will, in a sense, bloom, signaling that the season of Christ's return has started. So that begs the question, what is the fig tree? This is very clear. Throughout the Bible, Israel is referred to as the fig tree. The disciples understood that Jesus was referencing Jeremiah 24, where Israel was likened to a basket of figs that would one day be planted and blossom again, never to be plucked up. So for us today, when we see the promised replanting of Israel, we will know that the rest of the signs will follow. Israel as a nation was reformed May 15, 1948, but did not capture its historic capital, Jerusalem, till the Six-Day War in 1967. Looking at history, Israel's own concept of its restart, and the biblical notes of being reborn in a day, Isaiah 66, 8, it is very safe to say that the budding of the fig tree started in May 1948. So we will now look at a timeline that goes from the 1940s through the 2020s and at 40 prophetic and historic events that have happened within this time frame. For reference, we are here, 2013. Israel was reborn in May 1948, thus starting the lifespan countdown. In 2013, Israel celebrated its 65th anniversary. Most people think of a generation as a time span between generations, only a relative few years. However, Christ was describing the length of that generation. In other words, how long that generation would live, their lifespan. For example, today we still largely have the baby boomer generation, even though other generations have started after that one. When we look back at the time frame and parable of the fig tree, we are forewarned by Jesus Christ that all of the prophetic events which he had just described to his disciples would happen in that generation time frame, all of them, including the rapture, tribulation, and second coming. The fig tree prophecy mentions those who see this budding event and are already born just prior and are old enough to see and remember this historic event. For a plain reading, it would not be a stretch to say that they could already be four or five years old when this event occurs, old enough for them to remember. Adjusting for this would place most in this generation already at 70 years old this year, 2013. However, since we know that some of this generation will also see the tribulation period, we also have to take seven years out of this time remaining if we want to guesstimate remaining time frame for the rapture. So if we want to remove seven years, we find that we are already past the minimum time length of 70 years. It would be safe to say that this planet, as we know it, has less than 10 years left. That's not including the millennium. 10 years left total. We are right on the threshold of this historic generational timeline coming to an end. Remember that within 10 or 15 absolutely max stretched with most of that generation making it to 80 years, this world will experience a seven-year tribulation period. Alrighty, looking back at our timeline, let's look at the various generations that are currently living. First of all, we have Mr. Average Joe. He was born in 1943, five years before Israel was reformed. He remembers hearing his parents talk about it, but that's about it. Now, 65 years later, 
Joe is 70 years old. Back when he was 20, him and his wife had a son, Joe Jr., who is now 50 years old. Joe's grandson was born in 1983 and is now 30 years old. Joe's great-grandson was born in 2003 and is now 10 years old. So here we can see four concurrent generations with one of them having seen the rebirth of Israel and the start of the prophetic countdown. Joe knows that some of those from his generation will also see the rapture, some will see the tribulation, and some will still be here at Christ's final return to earth at the end of the tribulation. Now this chart is largely from an American perspective, but the same generational changes that we're going to look at occurred almost concurrently in other countries around the world too, with just a few years difference as the various influencing factors came into play in their culture and region. According to generally accepted history and observation, here are the dividing markers that marked significant and distinct changes in society from one generation to the next. The changes and descriptions are so distinct that the generations after those markers are defined by them. So let's look at them. The generation prior to this point is generally called the greatest generation. They grew up in the Great Depression, lived through world wars, and generally endured much hardship. But they knew how to work hard and sacrifice for their family. The baby boomers were the first generation to really think of generations as distinct. Hence, the accepted dates for the divisions vary by several years according to different researchers. However, toward our time, the dates are becoming more solidified as the distinctions are getting more obvious. Baby boomers. Those born during this time that saw themselves as very different from previous generations. They grew up in a time of dramatic social change. Hence, they have a greater propensity and acceptance toward social change. This generation was also marked by peak levels of income and prosperity. Um, this was also the first generation heavily marketed to from birth to death. This generation is often associated with counterculture, civil rights movement, and the feminist cause. Generation X, also known as the MTV generation, was coined to describe the vast generational change from the previous generations. This one was raised by television like no previous generation. Also, the divorce rates of their parents skyrocketed during this period and reportedly some of the worst divorces in American history. This influenced this generation and fueled in their children the Generation Xers what is often referred to as narcissistic wounds. They became much more self-centered because of some of the actions on their parents and that influence. Generation Y, Millennial Generation, also known as Generation Me, noted an increased sense of entitlement and narcissism. In other words, focused on themselves. It was impacted heavily by technological developments during this time, such as the internet coming onto the scene. Also, they are called trophy kids due to greater expectation of rewards. They are also known as the Boomerang Generation or the Peter Pan Generation, due to a delayed transition from childhood to responsible adulthood. They are also the least religious generation with a greater trend toward irreligion. In other words, atheism, secular humanism, etc. Generation Z. It is unique in that they have had lifelong use of communication and media technology. In fact, they're often called digital natives. From the time they were born, they grew up with smartphones and playing with things that the generation before them had not seen. This generation does not know of life and time without a lot of those gadgets. This technology and influence also greatly affects their behavior and this generation. Now that we have an understanding of the different generations within this lifespan and some of their distinctions, let's examine the signs that these generations have seen. First off, Joe's generation saw the start of the Jews regathering in Israel. This is a process and will not be fully regathered till the tribulation time, but Joe saw the reforming of the nation of Israel and has over his lifetime seen a large number of Jews return to their land. Not only have they returned to the land, but they have set up great farming and greenhouse works that have literally transformed many parts of the land. 
This is also a process and will reach completion in the Millennial Kingdom. Jerusalem reoccupied. Not only would the Jewish people have a nation again, but would also have their old capital city back. The city of Jerusalem was not recaptured till 1967, and officially the capital of Israel is still at Tel Aviv. Revival of Hebrew. The Jewish people who were scattered far and wide across the globe in various countries and languages and cultures still retain their Hebrew language, and once back in the land, their native tongue has been fully revived. The Israeli military again has been reformed with the nation and has already done various exploits in the various wars that they've been involved with. Wars. World War II, the most widespread war in history. Most people around the world may have felt like the world wars signaled the end of the world, but they too were also foretold that significant wars would precede the final signs. Matthew 24, 6 says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This also involves tribal and national wars, Matthew 24, 7. You know, not just state versus state or or nation against nation, but this also has the idea of uh, tribal wars and ethnic related wars that we've seen. Famines. The devastation and aftermath of World War II triggered numerous famines in the years after the war. Widespread famines in Africa and even incredible modern day shortages affect varying areas of the world still. During Joe's life was the largest famine in human history. China's Great Leap Forward Famine. The communist government had many of the farmers melt down their farming tools and turn to industrial work. Well, guess what? They found out that they didn't have enough farmers growing food, but it was too late. Millions died during the years of famine as they tried to recover. Knowledge growth. With the advent of the internet, information and knowledge has been flowing into a vast collective pool for the first time in history. Note that the Bible specifies knowledge, not wisdom. We have more information now than we almost know what to do with, yet in many ways we are not any wiser. False prophets. You can find a guru or self-proclaimed prophet touting themselves to be someone in almost every city. Healers and such, they can draw a crowd. But even the Bible records false prophets who did the same. Today, though, you don't have to go far to find them. Most city newspaper classifieds are filled with healers and shamans who use everything except true Christianity and Jesus Christ. False Christs. With the increase of internet and television media, we are definitely seeing more of these come out of the woodwork as they can easily gather a crowd. Now just do a search of the news and you'll find instances all over the globe. It can also apply to different messiah types and people who try to appear as the Son of God in different forms and names and titles. Travel growth. While mankind has explored and traveled the globe for millennia, it is just in the past 50 years that rapid expansion in interstate highways, high-speed bullet trains, jumbo jets, common availability of airports and air transportation, high capacity and long-distance means to various places around the globe, mean this, that our planet is literally crawling with people hasting from one place to another in large volumes. Diseases. Ironically, the rise in transportation has also hastened the spread of many diseases, such as avian and swine flu. Diseases such as HIV and AIDS continues to spread at alarming rates. Less publicized venereal diseases are also increasing dramatically. Drug-resistant strains, MRSA, etc., are quickly becoming more commonplace. Earthquakes. This is an awareness sign. Notice that the scripture contains the qualifier in diverse places. The point that it is making is not necessarily that earthquakes will increase, although they have been, but that you will finally get to a period in time where you can be made readily aware that earthquakes are happening all over the world and sometimes in some pretty remote places too. Consider that we now also have the ability to record and monitor earthquakes that happen on land and deep underwater, too, with pinpoint accuracy. Persecution. There is more persecution of Christians going on in our time and generation than at any point in history before. The intense persecution in Islamic countries, harsh crackdowns in communist countries, 
and even subtler forms of persecution in countries which have other religions as their dominant religion. Sadly, much persecution escapes the attention of Christians in affluent countries. Even secular sources will confirm that the majority of Christians killed by persecution has been the greatest in the 20th century and onward. Lack of love. People will become so inured and deadened through sin that most people have little or no true love and compassion. There will be a hardening. Some of this is attributable to the media and movies which have desensitized people to a wide range of emotions including what true love really is. Materialistic. Vast segments of our world are in deep debt because of their hunger and pursuit after things of this passing world. Whether it is cars, homes, or electronic gadgets, the things of this world have captivated their fancy, and large segments of our commerce and world economy is situated to appease their every whim. Sadly, a large portion of marketing is toward Generation X, who never had the childhood of the 50s. One major influence on these generations was Dr. Spock's influence. He started publishing his influential book on parenting in the late 40s. Later, the term the Spock generation came to refer to the two generations immediately after impacted by Dr. Spock's book. These generations were characterized by wanting instant gratification of their needs and wants, a certain permissiveness for their behavior, and noted narcissism. They were focused on themselves. Another influence was in the 1960s, school-sponsored prayer was prohibited by the Supreme Court. And this has definitely affected the generations and the country. Also, Roe v. Wade in the 70s opened the door for the largely unrestrained butcheries of abortion. Disobedient to Parents this one is so obvious and glaring that even the secular world sees it. Today's children are spoiled rotten with little true respect for authority or parents. It shouldn't surprise us that a large segment of our youth are also on various medications to make them more controllable. Unthankful. When a generation is taught that life revolves around them and that pleasures and things are ultimately for their enjoyment, then we should not be surprised that a deep sense of entitlement, loss of work ethic, and demands for their every whim characterize so many young people and adults these days. There is no sense of being thankful for it beyond a mere lip service. This characteristic is more commonly seen in affluent and prosperous countries, yet it is a unique trait to recent generations. Never before have large portions of mankind been so pampered and spoiled. Without self-control. When a society and generation is taught to follow their heart, and emotions over sound logic and judgment, we should not be surprised to see little regard to consequences of poor decisions. We see this largely in the form of debt, sexual diseases, divorce, errors in faith, etc. Because these individuals focus on themselves and their want and desires, it is often hard to convince them otherwise, even though you could show they are making unwise choices. Narcissism when a society is taught that life is all about them and their pleasures are the only thing that matter, we should not be surprised that overwhelming segments of our society today cannot relate to others. They are totally self-absorbed in their own world and desires. Proud boasters. Not only is our society and world more sinful today, but they have no problem boasting about their sin and taking pride in what is wrong. Most people do not blush anymore at sin, but wear it as a badge. Large segments of sinful behavior have even taken the title and banner of pride. It was in the late 60s that the Stonewall Riots marked the homosexual movement's unabashed placement in the public eye. The very next year, our nation had its first sodomite gay pride marches in three of our largest cities, a trend that has only grown since then. Hedonistic, acting like the heathen. Society worldwide is in large pursuit of toys and pleasures. Things and pursuits of lasting value are scorned in exchange for living in the moment, regardless of the consequences. Profane, unholy. As more and more people turn their back on God, we are finding a large surge in those who profess atheism and agnosticism. We are also seeing a growing number of people turn to witchcraft, Wicca, Satanism, and other pagan forms. 
blasphemers. Not only is God's name and all things holy profaned in every concourse, but it is also pumped into homes via visual and audio means, commonly called the media. Hard-hearted. When a society's conscience is so seared by sin, narcissism, hedonism, and paganism, it will naturally follow that the innate love and compassion toward others will be hardened and calloused. True love will be replaced with lusts, selfish control, narcissism, and other forms. Truce breakers. Honest and truthful people are very, very hard to find. Your great-grandparents and forefathers lived in a time where a man's word was his bond. Not so in these generations. False accusers. The propensity to lie, slander, notably under court oath today, is becoming much more frequent, almost commonplace. Fierce and savage. Sadly, the brutal and savage acts of barbarianism reported in the news are becoming much more commonplace. It is becoming common to hear of parents slaying their own children, gunmen trying to kill as many as they can, torture, brutal sex assault, a kidnapping, etc. Many of these horrific crimes would have been rarely heard of 50 years ago. Yet you can almost not go a day today without hearing multiple cases of such. Righteous despised. When a society and world gets to where they are proud and boastful of their sins, they will also despise and loathe any who would live godly or moral. Traitors, betrayers. With narcissism, self-love, and a general hardening, many people today do not think much of climbing over one another, stabbing them in the back, or shoving someone under the proverbial bus. The materialistic and selfish individual goals are more important to them than anything else. You will also find many media shows today promoting this sense of betrayal for the individual or group good. Heady Rash We find that people today are much more impulsive, hasty thinkers, and jumping to actions and conclusions with passion, but without much thought. This could be attributed in part to the bombardment of mental judgment and a shortened attention span from copious media consumption, it also comes from a society that is taught, in general, not to consider the consequences, but to live in the moment. False Godliness Sadly, one of the signs is the prevalence of a false sign. People pretending to be godly and Christian, yet just going through the motions. The passage tells us that while they have a form of godliness, they also deny the power thereof. In other words, they want to appear spiritual, Christian, etc., but they do not want God in their life or to tell them what to do. All around our nation and world we see churches preaching everything but a call to repentance and godly living. There is no fear of God in them. Signs in the Sun Awareness Sign Only in the last decade or so have we not only gained a much clearer and ongoing picture of solar activity, but we can now watch it in high definition in real time. We also have a much clearer understanding of significant solar events such as solar flares, coronal mass ejections, etc. Signs in the moon. This may be more evident during the tribulation as implied in Mark 13, 24, where it implies that dust kicked up by the large great earthquake will turn the moon a blood red. What is happening to earth will be reflected in a visible way to all mankind by the effect it has on the moon in the sky. Signs in the stars. Also, an awareness sign. Just within the past decade have we really become aware of the near-Earth flybys and news of celestial note that we're largely unaware of a generation ago. We're also now seeing, and able to see through mass media and internet, fireballs and meteor strikes, events that up until recently were seen only by a few at a time. These signs will continue through the tribulation period as well. Global Video Communication during the time of the tribulation, news will quickly spread about what is happening. Even today, the technology is already in place and use for video conferencing with smartphones and devices. Scoffers deny the return of Christ. Sadly, one of the signs of the last days and Christ's return is that there will be many who ignore the signs and insist and mock that Christ is not returning. Another important key to reference is that Jesus also said that these last days would be as the days of Noah and Lot. 
As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot. When we look at and study the pre-flood generation's timeline, we can learn several important observations that apply to us as well. One observation is Enoch, Noah's great-grandfather. He is the first recorded prophet he told of Christ's second coming and judgment, Jude 1, 14-15. It almost shouldn't surprise us then that God took this man to heaven without him dying, Genesis 5, 24, an early example of Christ's return for his children at the rapture. Methuselah, Noah's grandfather. The name Methuselah comes from two root words. One means death and the other means to bring or to send forth. Thus, the name Methuselah signifies his death shall bring. He was the longest living human, 969 years. He died right before the flood. And Jewish tradition states that he died just a few days before the flood. It was understood by four generations that judgment was coming after Methuselah died. The world was warned that the flood was coming. Likewise, there are four generations alive right now. Noah. In Genesis 7-1, God also references Noah in relation to his generation. Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Genesis 7-1. When God spoke this to Noah, Adam and Seth were already dead. Enoch was gone, and apparently Methuselah had also just died. So now the time frame specifically allotted to those four generations which was 120 years, uh, Genesis 6-3, had now come to a close, and it was time for Noah to board the ark. One interesting observation about Noah's life is that he was still alive for a portion of Lot's life. In Lot's account, God made sure Lot and his family were taken to safety before he sent judgment on Sodom, Luke 17-29. Jesus especially emphasized this point to his disciples. God called Noah and his family to safety in the ark before he sent judgment upon the world. Likewise, just like Noah and the animals were gathered onto the ark, God will call his children home before he judges the world with the tribulation. Jesus emphasized this point to his disciples in Luke 17:27. Interestingly, there was a seven-day wait period after God called them into the ark, before the floodwaters completely destroyed the world. Genesis 7.10 The Bible tells us that God shut the door to the ark, not Noah. Genesis 7.16 Only God knows when it will be time for his children to be called home. Until then, we must stay busy making sure we are ready and calling on others to accept Christ as their Savior too. Noah had the prophetic life of Methuselah. There were ways for him to glimpse the signs of the times. Likewise, God has given us over 40 signs that we see being fulfilled within the time frame that he has told us of. Once Noah, his family, and the animals were called into the safety of the ark, it was too late for them to make life changes or set things straight. All of that had to be done before the call. They had to make sure they were prepared for the other side before they got on the ark. Likewise, for us, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. What is nigh and even at the doors? Christ returned for his children. We have looked at numerous signs that all show us that we are indeed even at the doors and that time to make a difference for eternity is quickly coming to an end. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure.